Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 30, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussions following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we agree with the title of Tim Bradner's Anchorage Daily News op-ed. The state's fiscal situation is a result of a, quote, lack of guts to make the decisions, close quote. But the real question is, who is it that lacks the guts? Second, an ADN editorial board op-ed asks, quote, will 2022 determine Alaska's fiscal future, close quote. We discuss what it will take to make that a yes. And third, we discuss the latest announced 1 billion barrel oil discovery on the North Slope. Yes, there's a resource, but do those who finance projects of that scale care anymore? And now, let's join Michael. Well, Brad, um, man, some real hijinks going on uh, last night. I don't know if you want to dive into that quickly before we get into the weekly top three. I hate to take away from it, but man, it um, it was so interesting to watch the machinations uh, you think Nicola Machiavelli was back in the in the background, uh, you know, pulling some of the strings on some of this stuff. But maybe you want a quick comment before we jump into the weekly. Yeah, I, I, I will. There there were three votes that surprised me on the full PFD, um, and there were uh, four votes that surprised me on the 2300. The three that surprised me on the full PFD, given what they've said, given what they said during their campaigns, and of course, you know, you can take that with a grain of salt, I suppose. But, but. James Kaufman was a surprise. I, I understand the must read article. I understand his explanation of it. I don't agree with it, but it, I understand it. But but still, it was a surprise. He ran against Jennifer Johnson saying he was different, that he was going to be, you know, uh, he was going to be more receptive to the PFD. Um, and, um, and, you know, when push came to shove at the end of the day, he didn't. Uh, right. That would have made it a tie vote if he would have switched. Um, and then Chris Tuck, you're, you're giving Chris Tuck credit for voting yes he didn't uh on the full uh pfd i've got the screenshot up in front of me and uh tuck voted against uh the full pfd uh, did i say and tuck it was supposed to be neil foster and garantar did i say chris okay. tuck that would have been my fault yeah yeah um so tuck voted against it uh and tuck is was one of the original pfd defenders when uh when the PFD defenders were first formed, he was in some of the original news conferences with Wilikowski and and others, um, and uh, and he voted against it. And if he had switched, that would have made it a tie vote. If he, and if he and Kaufman had switched, that would have made it a, a, a majority vote for uh, uh, for the um, full PFD. And then uh, and then Liz Snyder, um, because Liz Snyder ran against uh, 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 Pruitt on uh, the uh, the banner of I'm for the PFD. He's been wishy-washy about it. I'm for the PFD. Uh, but when push came to shove again, uh, like Kaufman, she uh, she voted uh, she voted against it. So those three votes uh, surprised me. And then on the 2300, the um, the the uh, 50 the POMV 5050 uh, essentially vote. Um, Neil Foster switched over and voted against it. Uh, after Neil has said, uh, you know, he's in favor of a PFD because of concerns about the PFD, he switched over and voted against it. So those, those were, I mean, I, 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 you know, I can read Kaufman's words, 
Tuck will have some bizarre, you know, uh, rationalization for it. Liz Snyder, I don't know. Uh, but um, it, th those votes, those votes surprised me. Um, I thought there was a chance. Uh, and um, and those votes uh, went the other way. Yeah. Well, it's going to be very interesting to see how this gamesmanship is played. It leads us to our uh, it leads us to our weekly top three, uh, where we start off with a, a piece by Tim Bradner in the opinion section of the ADN, where he basically, I think, in a lot of ways, although I don't agree with the ultimate premise, I do agree with the headline of his article where he says uh, the heart of the state's fiscal stalemate is lack of guts to make tough decisions. Uh, so go ahead and dissect that for us. Well, Tim, um, it, it, it is, I mean, the article is good for its headline. I think it's a, it's an article in the, in the, an op-ed piece that Tim published had published in the ADN uh, a few days ago. Um, and the, and the headline is the heart of the state's fiscal stalemate, lack of guts to make uh, lack of guts to make tough decisions. And, and it is, I mean, everybody, I think, you know, this might be the one issue or the one statement that everybody agrees on, that there's the lack of guts. Now, they don't agree who, ha who it's who has the lack of guts necessarily, and they don't agree on uh, what, uh, you know, what somebody with guts would do. There's, there's a significant segment that says, you know, the lack of guts is the lack of of guts to make the necessary cuts in state spending to get the, to get the, uh, spending down to, to match revenue. There's others who say the lack of guts is the lack of guts to, you know, to, to say that, that we ought to pay out the PFD. We ought to put the Alaska economy and Alaska families first. Uh, and, uh, and the lack of guts is the lack of guts to come up with uh, alternative uh, revenue approaches. And then there's others who say the lack of guts is the lack of guts just to, just to cut the PFD down to, uh, down to uh, uh, its uh, uh, the leftover amount, uh, the Natasha uh, uh, Kelly Merrick uh, approach to uh, to resolving the fiscal dilemma. So there's not there's not a huge agreement on on what the lack of guts is about, uh, the lack of guts to do. Uh, but I, I think it's I think I think it's fairly universal that people agree that um, that it's a lack of guts to make some tough decision, whether to make spending cuts, whether to make, uh, uh, come up with substitute revenues or to make the PFD cuts that are uh, necessary to uh, balance the budget. I think a lot of people agree that I, I think almost everybody would agree. It's a, it's a lack of guts to make those, uh, lack of guts to make those tough decisions. I'll throw in a fourth. Uh, it's the, it, it, and, and it goes back to the working group. In the end, I think the working group uh, it was it was sort of an interesting process and an interesting result, but the result is the result that they came up with is that it needs to be a comprehensive plan. It's a comprehensive plan that that sort of touches all the bases uh, to go to a POMV 5050 PFD to go to uh, some spending cuts and to go to some sub some uh, alternative revenues. Um, and 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 I was surprised, uh, frankly, at the unanimity that the that the working group had uh, in reaching the decision to come to that sort of a, a little bit of what I would call a little bit of everything uh, uh, approach. Um, so maybe it's a Other, lack of cuts, otherwise known as a compromise. <laughs> uh, yeah, otherwise known as a compromise. Right. Um, but maybe it's a lack of guts to follow through on the compromise. I mean, right. Garen Tarr, the, the whole debate about the going to the POMV 5050 last night, going to, to the 2300 PFD, uh, the whole debate was was on an amendment to an amendment that Garen Tarr had proposed, uh, which was a, a sense of the legislature proposal, not not binding, but a sense of the legislature proposal, essentially to adopt the uh, the um, uh, the working group's uh, proposal to adopt a you know that we would go to a 50 50 POMV 50 50 PFD once uh, uh, other things were were in place and that was that was the proposal that was on the table the 2350 uh, uh, was an amendment to that that amendment got defeated so then you're back to the 2350 amendment got defeated so then you're back to the Garantar proposal. Of uh, of this sense of the legislature, and that got 
that that got first of all it got defeated by a little bit in the first vote then that vote got rescinded and then it got pummeled um in the second vote so you know you can also say it's a lack of guts to follow through uh even on what the 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 working group did uh, uh in terms of trying to come uh to some to some resolution i think i think to me there's really two uh, uh, lack of guts that, that are going on here that are key. Uh, one is the governors uh, to either fish or cut bait, either either make the spending cuts through the vetoes like you did in 2019 uh, and, and follow through on the campaign uh, uh, statements you made in 2019 that we were going to get spending down. We were going to get spending in, 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 in order or in, in to match uh, revenues. It's, it's the lack of guts either to do that or if you're not going to do that to follow through uh, with what his commissioner of revenue said uh, in front of the uh, in front of the fiscal group, uh, the fiscal working group, which was uh, to propose some uh, alternative revenues to balance the budget that way. And the, the governor just refuses essentially to do either. I mean, he 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 won't make he won't make the spending cuts after 2019. We've discussed that a lot on the show, uh, but he but he won't do it. Uh, and you know, there's reasons why he won't do it, but he won't do it. Um, and, and the legislature probably wouldn't back him up if he tried to do it again, just like they didn't in 2019. Um, so, so, you know, he won't do that, but then he won't do alternative revenues. Um, and I think, uh, that is, uh, uh, problematic. I mean, we're not going to, the comprehensive working group said, uh, we're not going to get to a compromise unless, unless it's an all in compromise. Part of that involves alter alternative revenues. The governor has to be a lead on alternative revenues. He has an obligation as the governor to balance the budget, and and the and the, and the budget has a huge huge hole in it. Uh, and 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 he's really he's not stepped out, uh, in my opinion, to to offer that. So I th that that's one set of lack of guts that I that I think is is sort of at the at the key here. The other lack of guts, frankly, is the House majority. Um, they, you know, they talk a good game. Liz Snyder talks a good game. Chris Tuck talks a good game. Neil Foster talks a good game. Co-chair of House Finance, by the way, talks a good game about, yes, we don't need to take the money. We, we shouldn't be taking the money out of middle and lower income Alaska families. We shouldn't be uh, hurry, pulling the fiscal lever that has the largest adverse effect on the overall Alaska economy. Uh, they talk a good game about that. But then when push comes to shove, they've not proposed alternative revenues. And I know there's a lot of analysis about, you know, they don't want to do that. They don't want to take the first step because the governor will then, you know, veto it if it passed. And then, you know, everybody will blame them for proposing alternative revenues. But, you know, we got to come to a solution someday, guys. Um, and, and if you're going to talk a good game about being concerned about Alaska families, if you're going to talk a good game about being concerned about the overall Alaska economy, then come to the table Put your money where your mouth is. Come to the table and uh, and and propose alternative revenues. To Garantar's credit, um, and I don't use those words often. To Garantar's credit, uh, as in in the in the first uh, session of the of the House yesterday before they took a break, in the first session, Garin proposed a bill that would increase oil taxes somewhat, and would and proposed a sales tax. Now I've talked a lot about why I don't like sales taxes, but at least she put something on the table. Right. At least she put uh, some revenues on the table, and the and the House uh, uh, Ways and Means Committee uh, has uh, has proposed a, a change in in oil taxes. Um, so there you see you sort of drips and drabs of it laying out there, but um, but as a body. The House majority has not moved forward. I think they lack guts for not moving forward to put their money where their mouth is by putting uh, alternative revenues on the table. When you look at this, and we just talked about Neil Foster and Garantar taking this vote, uh, surprising us. Again, it was a su surprise crossover with Garantar and Foster uh, voting for it. And um, both LeBon and Stephen, uh, uh, excuse me, Thompson and uh, and. Uh, um, uh, George or not George um, uh, Kaufman voting for it. My question was: Was this a true sense of what they were? Was this a political maneuver in your opinion? Did they do the math ahead of time and then vote late? 
Uh, I wasn't watching the vote, so maybe you've got a better tell on this than I do. But was this purely a political maneuver on the part of Foster and Tar, where they could see that it wasn't going to pass and so they could take this vote for their constituency? I think that's probably true about Sarah Rasmussen, uh, who's who's, you know, become very adept at uh, at figuring out where the winds are blowing. You got to remember that Garen started out this session voting against a full PFD in a House Finance Committee uh, meeting. She got herself on House Finance and uh, but then voted against a full PFD in a House Finance Committee vote and then voted for it on the floor uh, the first time when the first budget uh, was up. Uh, now voted for it again. I mean, she's just she's been all over the place, and I think I think that is true of Garantar. I think Neil Foster, um, uh, to some degree, has sort of got religion here. I think he's uh, he, he had a closer race in his district this last time than he's had in uh, in past races, um, and I think uh, that district is is giving him a message that uh, that that is is swaying his vote. I don't I don't think that he that that his uh, movement was as political as uh, as Rasmussen's. Um, Tuck, I mean, this uh, Tuck took a tough vote against uh, positions he's taken in the past. Um, I don't know if he'll come back to haunt him in that district because, generally speaking, that district is um, uh, is is more uh, uh, anti-tax than they are anti-PFD. Right. Um, he talks a good game, but then you know when it comes time to vote. Um, Kaufman, Kaufman, I, this is a tough, I, I think this is a tough vote for Kaufman. It would have been easy for him if he was, if he was truly playing the politics, he would have switched back over to the pro PFC D side. It wouldn't have passed the bill. Uh, it would have been a 2020 vote, but he would have gotten, uh, he would have gotten, uh, uh, credit for being a pro PFD. Um, so I think, I don't think that was political in his case. I, I, I do think that's true of Sarah Rasmussen, but, but the rest of them, I'm not quite. I'm not quite convinced that uh, that it was a swing with the winds type thing. Going back to James Kaufman, it's like he had this ready in the wings. I mean, this piece on Must Read popped last night after the vote. It was like he he knew what was coming. He knew what was going to happen. He dropped it all, and you know he did the vote, and then he he fired off the email to Suzanne Downing like immediately after the vote, kind of thing. Uh, which, I mean that. <sighs> I mean, that raises some eyebrows for me to begin with. But then I look at some of his justification, and I'm having a hard time buying some of the justifications here as to why he took this vote. Like you said, he voted, he he ran on being the anti-Jennifer Johnston, but this seems very much like a justification and a vote that I would have expected out of Jennifer Johnston. Yeah, you have to remember that that district is ultimately, a, uh, it is it is the wealthiest district in the state. Um I just, I just checked my numbers on that. Uh, it is the wealthiest district in the state, le- the wealthiest legislative district in the state. Um, so ultimately, uh, that's an anti-tax district. I mean, or an, yeah, an anti-tax district. Cut the PFD if you have to. It's an anti-tax district, um, and it's um, uh, 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 Kathy Giesel's old district. I, I, um, I think what happened with Jennifer is she just got way too far out in front in being uh, in being uh, uh, vocal about cutting the PFD and you know not uh, thinking that the PFD was something you know that that was it was a spending item and it was a low level spending item and we shouldn't be doing it and all sorts of things and I think she just got too vocal and I and I think that primary was was as much about Jennifer voting against Jennifer as it was for James. Um, so I, I think, I think what James is, is doing is he's sort of confronting the fact that his district's anti-tax, uh, and, um, and they would be very upset. I think that district would be very upset if, if ultimately the resolution of this was, 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 uh, certainly an income tax, but, but even a sales. Um, and I think he's tacking back toward, uh, toward what that, what that district is. Well, and I guess maybe that's what it is. Again, I just wasn't buying some of the justifications for what he was saying here. I mean, I understand the I, I, I can understand the mental gymnastics of why he, you know, sees it in his own mind, but 
uh, again, I'm just uh, I'm just not buying it. And this comes back, but this really does come back to the larger picture of what we're talking about. We've changed out some of the players. We've changed out some of the horses in the race. But the problem is, is that they all seem to be marching towards the same goal and playing by the same rules. Um, you know, we still have constituencies, as you point out, the most wealthy constituency says it's fine to take from them, but it's not okay to take from me, which has been the issue with people like, you know, Johnston or Kaufman, the people like Von Imhoff, the people like Stedman, where we've got a lot of this old guard that are still in there. We could change out all the players we want in, you know, the more red districts or the, uh, you know, or some of these other, but the bottom line is, is that we're, we're stuck. I mean, we're stuck with what they keep sending back. And if we keep ending up with the Von Imhoffs and the Stedmans and the Stevens and the Stutzes and the people who uh, on the Republican side, I mean, this is on the conservative side. People often say, well, you talk about changing out the players, but you never talk about changing out the Democrats. And I'm like, we've got to clean our own house up first. Are you <laughs> kidding me? I mean, fine. We'll tackle Democrats later. Can we get our own house, our own poop in a group before we start, you know, tackling those other things? I think that is the biggest challenge we face right now is we've got these business as usual people that keep going back and they are the stumbling blocks to what we're dealing with. Yeah, you yes. Uh, I mean, Steve Thompson and Bart LeBon are, are exhibit absolutely, a, absolutely. Uh, of 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 the issues and click Bishop on the on the Senate side is exhibit a. I mean, Fairbanks, <laughs> you've got you've got Republicans from Fairbanks. Uh, if they would have switched the vote, if if Thompson and Laban had been uh, had been uh, pro PFD last night, uh, that would have made the difference. And frankly, it would have given cover for Kaufman to cross over, um, I think. But you know, it's it's it 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 is the Republican side. You got Republican majorities in both in both bodies, um, and if the Republicans voted for the PFD, uh, it would pass in both bodies. Uh, but you know, it, it right. we we don't we don't have. Well, I mean, Fairbanks. Thanks, Fairbanks. The only two good, I think, legislators that are coming out of there, and by good, I mean aligning with my own personal philosophies, are uh, Rob Myers and Mike and and Mike Prax. Everybody else is, you know, Republican, quote unquote. But I mean, definitely uh, more business as usual Republicans than anything else. Less than sixty seconds here, Brad. Any final thoughts before we jump back into the weekly top three? Well, I, it, it's going to be a transition from the first to the second. Is yeah. There's lack of guts. Will that will that lack of guts translate into uh, into the 20, uh, 22 election? Well, it's going to be a doozy. That's all I'm saying. The 2022 election is going to be something like no other. All right, we're continuing now on the weekly top three. We just finished up with number two, which was the lack of guts, which leads us into number two, which is will the 2022 elections determine our fiscal future? Brad, uh, tie the tie the. The, the bow on this thing for us well the lack of guts is you know the lack of, of guts to to choose a direction uh, the lack of either to make the deep spending cuts necessary to balance the budget without without revenues the lack of of, of, of choosing uh, you know developing alternative revenues if you want to preserve the PFD or the lack to fully go through and and, and cut the PFD if that's if that's your if that's your choice. Uh, and all that's going to be on the table uh, in 2022. There was an editorial, first time I've agreed with the Anchorage Daily News editorial board in I don't know how long about a fiscal issue. But basically, this editorial says uh, 2022 is the, is the opportunity to determine Alaska's fiscal future. Possibly all 60 legislative seats because of redistricting, all 60 legislative seats uh, may be on the uh, uh, may be on the uh, on, on the ballot. Uh, the Constitutional Convention, the question about the 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 decennial question about uh, should we have a Constitutional Convention will be on the ballot. We have a governor's race uh, uh, on the ballot. So sort of everything uh, is is on the ballot. We've got uh, uh, ranked choice voting now uh, that we're gonna that we're gonna do all this with. Uh, it's it's gonna be 2022 is gonna be a wild one. And 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 and. The question is whether this lack of guts, this 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 uh, frustration over lack of guts, will carry through uh, and make uh, and make significant changes in the legislature uh, or in the governor's office in a way that uh, in a way that uh, uh, you know resets Alaska's fiscal future, allows a majority to form that sets Alaska's fiscal future. Um, I'll say this, Michael. You and I have been doing this. Uh, as you said, for seven years, 
that takes us through three gubernatorial elections, 2014, 2018, uh, and now coming up on, uh, on 2022. Each of those election cycles, we've said, this is the one. <laughs> this is the one that's going to determine our fiscal future. Um, uh, in 2014, it was Parnell against, uh, against Walker, um, ultimately against Walker. And, uh, and, you know, Parnell had been, it, through his lack of discipline, lack of fiscal discipline, and sort of led us into this path that we've, that we've been on in the following decade, Walker promised to be, Walker promised, to be different than Par Parnell on those issues. Ultimately, Walker uh, didn't didn't fulfill that. In 2018, uh, we had Walker uh, Begich against uh, against Dunleavy. Dunleavy, you know, was I'm going to come in there. I'm going to you know control Alaska's fiscal future, uh, and uh, and and we're going to get this done. Uh, he got elected. He tried in 2019 to go down the road that that at least he talked about uh, during the campaign. That got frustrated. He changed, and and he really hasn't been on that, on that same road since. In 2020, in the legislative elections, it was you know we're going to elect uh, people who will you know essentially follow uh, Dunleavy and go down this road again. Uh, there were inroads made, uh, but then uh, but then there were there were losses. I mean, so um, uh, we had. Uh, uh, Mel Gillis, is that was was that against Calvin Schraggy? Schraggy won that race. Yep. You know, Schraggy hadn't won that race. If if Gillis had won the race, there there if that would have contributed to a different vote last night. Schraggy voted against the PFD, both the full PFD and the and the twenty uh, the twenty uh, three hundred one. So we've had these elections before where we're where we've said this is going to do it. This is going to be the one where we're finally going to set the course. Um, and uh, and and get it accomplished and 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 go forward. And we've elected people who have campaigned on on doing that uh, and 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 said they're going to do it. Uh, and then they haven't. So you know, 2020. When I read this headline, I have two reactions to it. Uh, one is, yeah, I've been here before. I've seen this stuff before. Um, <laughs> and uh, and and it never works out the way you want it to work out. But the but the other one about 2022 is everything. Everything is going to be on the playing field. Um, and if there is a statewide move one way or the other, then we, then we actually may get uh, a, a fiscal resolution. Right. Well, okay. Again, cause it, this is going to be a hot mess. Okay. So with redistricting, every legislator seat is going to be up. If the redistricting holds for what they have right now, every legislator seat is going to be up. We have jungle primaries, which is basically just the top four vote getters. That's it. So it's going to be, I mean, again, you could have 10 people running for a single seat and it's still the top four vote getters. And then you've got ranked choice voting for the main event. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's it's going to be crazy. This is going to be something that has been unseen in the state of Alaska in its history. So, I mean, there's there's a lot of opportunity for weirdness to occur over the next 18 months. Yeah, it, what you really want is is sort of a um, a, 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 a statewide prairie fire, as they used to call it in Oklahoma, a statewide uh, move to go one direction or the other. You know, the, 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 the challenge we've had is some districts have moved, but other districts haven't. Um, uh, you, you know, you get a change and you get Rob Myers to replace John Coghill. That's a that's a move. Uh, but Bert Stedman's still there. Bert Stedman's still in place. Uh, Click Bishop is still there. Uh, Steve Thompson, Bart LeBond are still there. So you get some movement, but you don't get enough to change the uh, change the course. What you really want is is you know to get this issue resolved you really want a prairie fire you really want a, a statewide movement one direction or another saying we're, we're going to go in this direction I, we're not i i don't sense that prairie fire right now i sense a lot of little micro elections that are going to sort of you know keep us going in the in the direction we've been going in this in this stalemate we've been in uh, but but what you really would like to see is is you know just a statewide sense of we've got to get a resolution. This is the resolution we're going to get, and I'm going to vote in my district consistent with 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 uh, bringing about bringing about that resolution. 
Uh, the other thing that just got mentioned by Senator Myers in the chat room is the other thing that we didn't throw into the mix is, of course, the uh, uh, decennial uh, uh, constitutional convention. That's going to be on the on the on the the docket as well. Alaskans could vote to open it up and put the PFD in themselves if uh, the legislature doesn't have the moral fortitude to do so. Uh, yeah, amongst I'm really other hesitant. things. Uh, Monk, I'm really, I'm really hesitant on that vote. Oh, I, I am as well. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll be honest with you. Anytime they start talking about constitutional convention, I understand the frustration level and everything else, but I am deathly afraid of opening up the constitution uh, because it wouldn't be just the PFD that could be at issue. Special interests could get in there and monkey this whole thing up. Yeah, yeah, and and that's and, and that's the problem. It's not, it's not a single shot. Not a single shot change. It's a it's a full opening, and and it's just that that to me is that to me is problematic. But you know, it it is on the ballot, and it will motivate some people, and maybe that'll be what triggers the prairie fire. But that's you to to really for the 2022 election to be different from 2018, 2014, 2020. There's got to be some sort of statewide prairie fire, statewide movement toward uh, toward uh, 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 one position or another. Or else, if we have these micro elections, uh, where every where Bert Stedman stays, Click Bishop stays, uh, Natasha stays, if we have if that's sort of the result of it, I, I'm not sure we I'm not sure 2022 changes much. Michael Chambers says Brad is incorrect. Kathy Geisel is going to jump in, and this will piss off voters all over the state. <laughs> it's a possibility. I mean, there's been rumors that she's gonna. She's going to uh, she's going to come in here and 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 try and get back into us, which will make it again. I mean, it will be a sticky hot mess for sure. My, Michael's Michael's uh, statements, whenever he's following up on anything I say, is always the first sentence is always Brad is incorrect. So yeah, yeah no. but, but it's just a question of what I'm incorrect <laughs> about now in Michael's mind. But he's not wrong on the uh, uh, on the Kathy Geisel angle. If that, I mean, that's just one more component to throw in there and talk about. I mean, this is this is a tough the problem is this in in my opinion. We keep, you know, you're right, Brad. We said in 2014 this is the election that will decide the fiscal future of Alaska. No, no, no. 2018 this is the election that will decide the fiscal future in Alaska. No, 2022 this is the election. The problem is there's no more there's no more money. Uh, I mean, really, there's I mean, we're reaching a point of no return where there is no more money. They can't continue to kick this can down the road indefinitely. Um, So, I mean, they're going to try. Didn't we say that before, though? I mean, I I mean, it's just a question of whose ox is going to get gored. Well, that's true. I mean, you're not you're not wrong. But I just feel like at some point somebody's going to have to say somebody's got to gut up and nut up and do the thing that they need to do. Yeah, somebody's got to have the guts. Exactly right. It's just a question of which way the guts go. Yeah, do the guts go and do the guts go to, to spending cuts. I mean, Governor Dunleavy tried it. Huge pushback. Do the guts go in, in favor of PFD cuts? Uh, yeah, that's where that's where Governor Walker tried that. He got he got run out of office. Do the guts go in favor of alternative revenues? Well, you got James Kaufman who, you know, came up to the line and said, "Nope, not going down alternative revenues. I vote against the PFD." So. Right. It's just a question of where the guts go. Uh, number three is, of course, this discovery by 88 Energy up on the North Slope, which, I mean, good news, bad news. I mean, who knows these days with all the things that are flying around out there? I mean, we're only paying a third of our budget with oil revenues, where it used to be almost all of the uh, budget was paid with oil revenues. So you'd think everybody would be super excited about a billion barrel field that uh, is coming out. Give us your quick thoughts on this here, Brent. Well, it's almost we're almost to the point of another week, another billion barrels. I mean, we, we, we people it, it's it's late in coming, but but people are now discovering that, yes, there is a lot of resource oil resource left in Alaska. The problem is the challenge is, is it ever going to be developed? Um, a lot of these announcements, I mean, I've been in the industry a long time. I've seen these sorts of things a long time. A lot of these things are just trying to hype the stock, right? Oh, we got a billion barrels. Buy our stock, you know, you know, bet bet on us, um, and and keep us going, you know, finance our our drilling program, um, and and it's true. There is, I mean, we are discovering a lot of resource on the slope, but given what happened to Conoco's Willow project, given the fact that uh, that oil search uh, uh, is now being is now being merged out of existence because you know it people didn't believe in its uh in its uh in, in its hype 
Um, given the fact that 88 is really just a junior player and really doesn't have the financing at one point, they didn't have the financing even to drill wells this coming winter. Um, maybe they've solved that problem with the, with the hype. But it's, yes, we've got resource. The question is, can we get financing? It used to be about used to be about getting getting you know investment and and developing the resource. It it still is. Can we get the investment we need? And it's not as much anymore as it was back in the early 20 teens. It's not as much as more anymore about what can Alaska do? Can we change our oil tax program? Can we give oil tax credits? Can we do something to bring investment here? That's that's really a minor part of it anymore. It's whether on the world stage. You can find investors to come into a challenged environment. Alaska is certainly that. The, the, the district court's decision in the, in, in the Willow case makes it even more challenging. The Biden administration's uh, 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 hesitancy with respect to you know, additional leases and, and the type of environmental review that they're putting everything under now uh, certainly makes it even more challenging. Can you, can you get investment to come into this challenged environment to uh, to develop things. I think Conoco is going to has the patience to see it through, but I still am very skeptical about whether Pika the Pika project is going to attract the investment necessary to develop it, particularly with oil search being with Santos uh, taking over uh, oil search and Santos not really having a much focus on Alaska. And I'm even I'm even more skeptical about this about the 88 project, uh, the 88 energy project of developing uh, of developing these resources. Very junior player, no financing on their own. They're going to have to, you know, attract a major player to come in and do it. And I and I just I I'm very skeptical that's going to happen. Well, so yeah, especially in light of course the Biden administration's philosophy on uh, domestic uh, energy production. On top of all that, I mean, it's just that's just icing on the cake at this point. Yep. Yeah, so it's great to have these announcements. I love to see headlines, but but in terms of of predicating policy on them, things the state should do, state bending over backwards, or the state giving additional tax credits, or you know doing various things, I, I don't think that's justified. I don't think we can. I don't think the state can uh, can can sway the decision one way or the other. Uh, and the state, I, I think it's I think it's uh, uh, the wrong way to go. To uh, to assume or to plan on these uh, these things ultimately uh, delivering. You are so full of good news. My God, it's just it's just astonishing how well, great that, it, it's it's realism. <laughs> and, no, and Michael, I'm, that's what we've lacked through the twenty teens. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. No, I mean you and I again have been pumping this pump for years, and yet here we sit, still looking as ugly as we were back in 2014. Um, all right. Well, even worse, because now we don't have billions of dollars sitting in savings to cover it. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.